If you have your Bible, please turn with me to the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 11, beginning in verse 9. And as you turn there, or click there, or however you get there, uh, please join me in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for the light of your word. And I pray you'd speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if you've been with us, you know that uh, in my current series, we're working our way through the book of books of First and Second Kings, sort of in big picture sections, uh, some larger than others. And what I what we said, well, what we saw last time uh, two weeks ago was the life of Solomon, what I described as the wisdom and the folly of Solomon. And so we're kind of picking up there where we left off, but just a reminder. The reason that we're doing this and kind of taking in these Old Testament books in kind of bigger chunks at a time is, one, we don't have the time to go through all the details of all of the Old Testament, at least in this series. And so, nonetheless, uh, what, I, what I want to do is we're, the goal that I really have in mind is that we would come to know the Bible better, so that we come to know the Old Testament Better that we get to know First and Second Kings better, <clears throat> and as a result, that we would get to know Almighty God better. Amen. Mm-hmm. And that's really the goal, and that we would not only know the Bible and God better, but also that we would have ears that would hear and hearts that would understand what He would say to us. And so, I want to begin again. Uh, we touched on chapter eleven two weeks ago, and I just want to pick up here. This morning, as we see the very end of King Solomon's life. In verse 9, it says, And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning the thing that he should not go after other gods. But he did not keep what the Lord commanded. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, Since this has been your practice, And you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I have commanded you. I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Yet for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it in your days. But I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all of the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem that I have chosen. Now, What follows here in the rest of chapter 11 is what describing the ways in which the Lord himself raised up enemies against Solomon. Now, the first two, this guy here in verse 14, Hadad the Edomite, and then in verse 23, Rezin the son of Eliab. These two are actually guys that had grudges with King David, Solomon's father. And now they've come into during the generation of Solomon and are causing him trouble. But the main one we're going to hone in on to some extent in verse 26 is this guy named Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Verse 26 describes him as a servant of Solomon. In verse 28, it says, the man Jeroboam was very able. And when Solomon saw that he, that the young man was industrious, he gave him charge over all the forced labor of the house of Joseph. Now, hang on a second. The forced labor of the house of Joseph. If you remember, run back in your minds to the book of Genesis. Who was Joseph? Joseph was one of the youngest bro- uh, sons of Israel, or Jacob. And his brothers were jealous of him, and they sold him as a slave in Egypt. The first Israelite to serve as a slave in Egypt. And ultimately, the Lord exalted him to rule over all of Egypt. And all of his brothers and his family came and sought his help. And they were freed and liberated only to, again, generations later, be enslaved by the Egyptians as a people. And then the Lord raised up Moses and delivered them out of Egypt and ultimately into the promised land where they lived in freedom and prosperity, where the Lord was their king and their God. And then now under Solomon, Solomon, toward the end of his life, or at some point, Solomon began to enslave his own people. And so Jeroboam was one of the young men who had responsibility for the forced labor, coerced labor, among God's people 
among the house of Joseph in particular. So what follows is Jeroboam. You know, some commentators would observe the way in which he likely was aware of the complaint of the people of Israel against their own king. And nonetheless, a prophet comes to, I'm just summarizing now, a prophet came to Jeroboam and said, I'm going to tear, the Lord says, I'm going to tear the kingdom from Solomon, specifically from his son, and I'm going to give it all to you except for one tribe that I'm going to let. This is because of what Solomon has done and because of what Solomon has not done. It's because Solomon has gone after other gods. He has lived a vile life by his own lusts and pursuits and also and also because of what he has not done. It says here in verse 33, they have not walked in all of my ways, doing what is right in my sight, and keeping my statutes and my rules as David, his father, had done. And so that's what the Lord tells Jeroboam. So he files that away. And in fact, what happens is it says that whenever Solomon finds out that that's what the Lord has said to Jeroboam, he seeks to kill Jeroboam. He wants to not only keep that from happening, keep the word of the Lord from happening, but he wants to actually murder, murder this man who would be his rival. But what the Lord tells Jeroboam in verse 38, he says, if you, Jeroboam, will listen, do all that I command you and will walk in my ways and do what is right in my eyes by keeping my statutes and my commandments as David my servant did I will be with you and I will build you a sure house even as I built David for David and I will give Israel to you and I will afflict the offspring of David because of their sin and rebellion because of the, these things but not forever and then we reach the end of Solomon's life, and it says he died, and his son Rehoboam reigned in his place. Now, here's where we find ourselves at the end of the life of Solomon. Not only was the Lord angry with Solomon, but frankly, so was everybody else. And what we find here is that the reality is at the very end of Solomon's reign, after only one of the sons of King David, the entire nation of Israel is a powder keg waiting to go off. And they are just ready to come apart. The 12 tribes. And they've all come together first under Saul, then under David, and most notably. And then Solomon held them together as a coalition. But now the edges are fraying and they're beginning to tear apart. Solomon's kingdom had been a rich and a prosperous and a thriving kingdom, but his success had predominantly been built on the backs of his very own people through hard and forced service and heavy taxation. And he had held it together in his lifetime, but the edges were fraying and it was about ready to come apart. So I want to continue to read and summarize in chapter 12, if you want to follow along. In fact, actually, let me get the first map, Ethan. So I, if you can see this, this is a picture, a map of Solomon's kingdom. So this is what Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, inherited. And so what we see is Rehoboam is the last king over all Israel. And so Solomon was the last one to rule his entire life over the people of Israel. And Rehoboam was the last king to rule over Israel as a nation. And this is where the story plays out. So Rehoboam, he went to Shechem, which is here in the hill country, right about in the center, right in the very middle. It's kind of the historic meeting grounds for the people of Israel when they would covenant together. And so he goes there, and all of Israel comes. And Jeroboam, this guy who's received this word from the Lord, he fled for his life whenever Solomon sought to kill him. He fled to Egypt. Well, he hears that Solomon has died. And now he comes back to the land of Egypt, and he comes with, from the land of Egypt, and he comes with the Israelites, and they all gather together with Rehoboam. And they said, your father, verse 4, made our yoke heavy. Now therefore, lighten the hard service of your father Solomon, and the heavy yoke that's on us, and we will serve you. And he said, give me three days, you guys go away. And let me think it over. Now, you can read the details here, but what follows is 
he sought the counsel, Rehoboam sought the counsel of his father's advisors, the old men in Israel. And in verse 7, it says, They said to him, If you will be a servant to this people today, and if you will serve them, and if you will speak good words to them when you answer them, then they will be your servants forever. But Rehoboam abandoned the counsel that the old men gave him and took counsel with the young men who had grown up with him and who stood before him. And he said to them, what do you advise me? And he says, this is what they've said. And what do they say? They say, what you ought to say is my pinky is bigger than Solomon's thighs. The yoke he put on you is nothing compared to what I'm about to do. And so get ready. Solomon disciplined you with whips. I'm going to discipline you with scorpions. And that is exactly what Rehoboam turned around and said to them three days later. And how do you think they took that? No, thank you. <clears throat> All of Israel to your own tents, Jeroboam said. We have no part in King David. So the result was devastating. Verse 15, the king did not listen to the people, for it was a turn of affair brought about by the Lord that he might fulfill his word which the Lord spoke by the prophet to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. So you see here the dynamic between men's choices and the sovereign will of God at play. It's a mystery we see in the Bible often. But nonetheless, what followed is, verse 16, all Israel, when they saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, what portion do we have in David? And they all abandoned the king. Then Rehoboam even sent in his taskmaster, who was over all the forced labor, and what did they do? They took him and they stoned him with stones. Verse 18. So, verse 19. Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David unto this day, until the writing of the book of 1 Kings. And when all Israel heard that Jeroboam had returned, they made him, they anointed him king. Rehoboam wanted to revolt with a civil war and to go conquer them. And God sent a prophet and said, this thing is from me, I want you to cease and to desist. So let me get the next map up. So this is a picture, an image, a map of what's left after this encounter. Is you have Judah to the south, the one tribe that stayed faithful to King David, and where Rehoboam was the first king of the southern kingdom. And then you have Israel to the north, where Jeroboam became king of the rest of the tribes of Israel. And this will be important, understanding the rest of the Old Testament and understanding the rest of the books of First and Second Kings and everything else that follows. <clears throat> but one more portion of this that I want to read before we uh, move further. What follows here, it's certainly it's last but certainly not least, is the story of what happens with Jeroboam as he takes over control in the northern kingdom in the land of Israel. And it says here in chapter 12, verse 25, Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim, and he lived there. And he went out from there, and he built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom will turn back to the house of David. So he's worried about his kingdom. Now, God has spoken to Jeroboam, but he doesn't trust in the word of the Lord. But what he does is he, he's going to take matters into his own hands. He's insecure in his own position and power. And he says, they, okay, because the temple is where? The Judah. temple is in Jerusalem. And so he's worried that all of his people, when they pilgrimage to the temple, that they're going to ultimately abandon him and go back to Judah and back to the line of David. Now, that was not what God said was going to happen, but that's his insecurity and his fear. That's what he's being driven by. He doesn't want to lose what he's obtained, and he is being driven by that for his own greed and lust for power. And so as he's kind of taking stock of this, verse 27, he says, If the people go up and offer sacrifices in the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, then 
the heart of the people will turn again to their Lord, to Rehoboam, the king of Judah, and they will kill me and return to Rehoboam. Verse 28, so the king took counsel and he made two calves of gold, two idols. And he said to the people, you have gone up to Jerusalem long enough. Behold, these are your gods, O Israel. These are your gods who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. And this thing became a sin for the people who went as far as Dan to be before one of these idols. He also made temples and high places and he appointed priests and from among all the peoples who were not of the tribes of Levi. And Jeroboam appointed a feast on the 15th day of the 8th month like the feast that was in Judah, the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles, and he offered sacrifices on the altar. So he did in Bethel sacrificing to the calves that he had made and he placed in Bethel the priest and the high priest that he had made. And he went up to the altar that he had made in Bethel on the 15th day of the eighth month, in the month that he had de devised from his own heart. And he instituted a feast for the people of Israel, and he went up to the altar to make offerings. Can I get the next slide? So here's a picture uh, map. Again, you got Judah in the south and Israel to the north. And he sets up these two. Now, what do you think of when you think of he made these statues of cattle, oxen? Kind of reminds you of the Exodus, right? Whenever Moses is up getting the Ten Commandments and Aaron's down in the plain with the people, and they say, make for us a God. You know, and they abandon God. They create their own God out of their own heart. They're, we don't know what has happened to Moses, but and they say, here is your God, O Israel. And they enter into idolatry, and there was judgment on that. And yet here again, in Bethel and in Dan to the north, you know, it's got to be accessible and, you know, it's got to be adaptable to the culture. You know, we've got to really accommodate everyone so our idolatry can reach as many people as possible. So they established these centers on one end of Israel and on the other so that they would never have to go again to the temple in Jerusalem. And this becomes the habitual sin, the predominant and the first sin of the people of Israel throughout all the rest of the book of First and Second Kings. As the story continues, these things continue on as a part of the story. And now, so obviously there's more to the story. And there's more we could say about Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Jeroboam and there's more we could say about Judah and Israel that's told in the next uh, chapter or two. Because what we see is clearly, if you keep reading, in the final analysis, both men, according to the Bible, did quote what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And as a result, all of Israel, Judah and Israel, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And though these two kingdoms existed for a long time in kind of the sad unraveling of their story and of what God began in their midst, um, Really, what we see here is the seed of their destruction. This is the beginning of the end for the people of Israel in the promised land. And it all begins right here. In fact, let me go back. You go back to the map just before this. So here, as we have Judah in the south and Israel to the north, this is an image you've got to have in mind when you read the books of First and Second Kings. Because First and Second Kings, from this point on, is the history of the overlapping history of these two kingdoms, of the kings in the south and the kings in the north. And it goes back and forth, back and forth. That's the pattern of the books of First and Second Kings from this point on. So if you're like, I thought we were in Israel. Well, it's because they're catching you up on what was going on in Judah. Or if it's like, I thought we were in Judah, it's because it's catching you up on what's going on in the north. So back and forth. And back and forth it goes. So, what I want to do, this is not quite my conclusion, but we're almost there. This is the, the, the landing gear has come out, okay? <laughs> First and foremost, we're reading about two men primarily. Now, we could talk about all of Israel, but Israel and Judah, but two men in particular who certainly did not, did Rehoboam, Jeroboam, frankly, we could talk about Solomon. Three men, 
these are men who did not know God well if they knew him at all. And they certainly did not live in light of God's word to them in the Bible. I want to read a verse I've alluded to in, these ser in this series, but we've not read it specifically yet. And if you want to turn there, I'm in Deuteronomy chapter 17, uh, beginning in verse 14. So this is literally the law within the law of Moses concerning kings in Israel. And I'll just summarize the first section, which is where it says, The Lord said to the people of Israel, When you come into the land, the promised land, you can set a king over you if you choose to. It has to be one that I choose. And here are some things about that king he must not do. That king must not gather unto himself many horses. He should not lead the people of Israel to go back to trust in Egypt, because I've told them you should never go that way again. He should not amass for himself many wives or much gold and silver. Does Solomon come to mind? Okay, Solomon's breaking every one of these, and all the other ones after seem to follow suit. And so that's kind of the general description of what ought not to be going on. But in verse 18, it begins to be very clear about what ought to happen. When this king sits on his throne, on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law, approved by the Levitical priest, so it's not his own private version of the Bible, right? Not like he can just make it say whatever he wants. It has to be approved by the Levitical priesthood. And it shall be, it shall be not only written by him, but it shall be with him. And he shall read in it all of the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them. and that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers and that he may not turn aside from the commandment either to the right hand or to the left so that he may continue long in his kingdom he and his children in Israel now I ask you do you think any of these kings we've talked about so far have obeyed this passage of Scripture? I mean, the presumption, I think, to some extent, is that Solomon seems to have some awareness of what God has revealed in the Bible, in the law of Moses, and what has preceded him. But through the demonstration of his life, he does not seem to be a man who has a copy of the law with him that he's meditating on day and night, walking in the light of Solomon does not seem to be a man who lives in such a manner. And then certainly Rehoboam, Jeroboam, would not either. Here's the reality. God has spoken to us in his word. The Lord has removed for us all of the guesswork about what it means to know God and about what it is to live life in light of who God is and what he's like. And he's removed the guesswork for us by preserving for us for all time in his word, preserving who he is, what he's like, and what life lived as a human being ought to consist of. God has spoken. And with the kings in Israel being just simply one of the other brothers among all of the people of Israel who is not to be exalted above them all, but is to serve them and to lead them. He is to be an example of what it is to know God and to follow Him. And the way in which the king was to do that was to meditate daily upon the Word of God, and in so doing, to renew his mind, to be transformed, to walk in light of His Word, to respond to the correction of God, and to live it out in his life. And yet we see the kings of, the Israel, of Israel falling short here time and again, but what we see in them is something that we also only see in us. This propensity for us to go astray from God. It's, it's in our nature, right? We're born with the contagion of rebellion against God. And the Word of God, by the Spirit of God, is given to us to keep us on the straight and narrow about who God is, about what consists of following the Lord, our God, our Creator, and how that goes. And we need the constant guardrails of, of the law of God, of the word of God, so that we can stay within the path. And so this is an example, but it's a reminder to us 
that God has spoken to us in his word. And we will not hear God well ever if we do not live in light of his word. If we're not constantly seeding our hearts and our minds with the ever-living and all-powerful word of God, we will not hear clearly when God wants to speak to us because he speaks to us primarily through the light of his word. It is written. And the admonition, I think, for us, the application for us, and my first point is this, that God has spoken and that we, like the king was called to, because we're called um, to be a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We're kings and priests to God most high in Jesus Christ. And if we want to live towards God and for God and serve other people well, then we need to have the book of God's word with us. And we need to read it all the days of our lives. I've been talking about this so far all year. And we're only in February. Okay, so don't don't lose, don't let me lose you now, okay? I want to encourage you. It's not just because we're focusing on it right now, but this is important for our entire lives. As long as we live our lives, that we would be those that live in light of the Word of God, that we read God's Word, study God's Word, respond to God's Word. And again, okay, I've already said this in many ways, but I don't care what part of the Bible you're reading or how much of it you're reading, I just want to encourage you to read the Bible for yourself. Amen? Read the Bible. Walk in light of its word to you and let God work in your heart and mind to change you. This is predominantly how we grow in Christ. I'll tell you, you know, we've talked about this, I know, already. One of the things that will happen when we read the Bible is you run into words and places and timelines that are hard to follow. And that's hard, right? You know, you read that and you're like, you just scratch your head and you struggle with that and sometimes that's why we quit reading is because I, I can't make sense of the timeline or the map or whatever it is <clears throat> okay well that one is the most innocuous reason that we stop reading the bible sometimes it's because you read along does this ever happen to you like maybe this week where you read along and you find something that's troubling to you you're like i don't understand that or or that sounds Man, I just don't have know how to square that with the world or, or my understanding of God or, or whatever. You, you ever deal with that? Where it's hard. Like you actually, to the point you might feel bad about it. Have you ever done that? You're reading the Bible and you, you read something about maybe something that God does or something that God says. And you feel like, I don't, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that. And you feel bad about it. Well, often what we do is we close our Bible and we run away from it hard things. We're going to, but that is to short circuit one of the primary ways in which we grow as Christians is by wrestling with God when we don't understand things. Okay? It's not enough to just say, well, God said this or God did this and, and I, I don't really want to make it that, so I'm just going to leave it alone. Okay? Or, I'm gonna, or worse, I'm going to say, well, God would never do that. God would never say that. When actually the Bible says God indeed is like this. He indeed does these things. And so the reality is we have to wrestle with that. And there's an invitation there for us to wrestle with God. You ever have this problem with other people where you go along and you think you really know them well and then something happens and you're like, oh my gosh. this," Or, or maybe it's yourself. You think, wow, I didn't realize I was like that. Okay. Well, it's getting, it's the process of getting to know and you, and you get to know other people through a series of understandings and misunderstandings. And so the reality is, even in God, it's this way. Uh, we short circuit our ability to grow in Christ when we run away from things that seem to conflict or cause us trouble with God. It's an invitation that we would go deeper with God. Even if you come out the other end saying, I'm still not sure how to sort that out, the process really matters. Don't short circuit the process. The other thing is the Bible, and in fact, uh, last week our guest speaker, he quoted this. I'll just quote him again. It's not just that we read the Bible. The Bible reads us. And sometimes we don't like that because the Bible reads our mail. You know, we read the Bible and we don't like the way it confronts us, the way it challenges us, the way it corrects us. 
Maybe it's because we feel like, well, I can't change. I, no. Well, it's an invitation to repentance. It's an invitation to grace. It's an invitation to encounter Almighty God. So I'm encouraging us. And again, this is my first and my primary point. If you hear nothing else that I say this morning, read the Bible for yourself. Amen? What did I say this morning? Okay, thank you. Amen. Now, there are many other points that I could talk about this morning, and I am only going to highlight them in the event that you want to run them down and think about them for yourself. So we could talk about this idea, say, spiritually speaking, where ground that has been taken can be lost. We think about uh, the kingdom of Israel. We think about what God had done there and Solomon and everything that he had to build upon and even his son, everything that he was given that he could have, and the way in which they just felt entitled and presumed upon that. And the reality is those things, I'm not talking about your salvation can be lost, but I mean grounds taken spiritually can be lost if we just want to go on autopilot. And so, well, this is the way things are. This is what I've been given. And this is the way it will always be. Our walk with God does not operate like that. We are accountable to walk with God day by day. And uh, we see some of that in the lives of these men in the books of, King, books of Kings. Secondly, we could talk about this idea of servant leadership. Jesus makes this point time and again that we ought not to lead like the world, for we lord it over other people. But the example of the Bible consistently is that God, who's the king of heaven and earth, how does he love and lead us? He's certainly our king and sovereign. But yet he serves us by laying down his life for us. And that is the example of leadership in the Bible. That we'd not be entitled, but we would lay our lives down. We could talk about the idea of the young men and the old men. The counsel that Rehoboam saw. The old men told him and said, no, you know what? If you would serve them, if you would serve them, they will be your servants forever. And Israel will stay together as a people. And he said, no, I'm not interested in that. All my buddies tell me I ought to go really crack the whip. Okay? And so we see in that story, the council, we see the zeal and the idealism of the youth and perhaps even the pride contrasted with the wisdom of the aged and the wisdom of the, those that are older. And the reality is here, just as sort of a side point, is the reality is we need both of those. We need the zeal and the idealism and the energy of kind of the, the young and the, the up and coming, the young or the future, right? And that's why, in fact, sometimes in our older, later years, we make way for things we shouldn't because we're like, okay, it's their time. And then they go drive it off the cliff. Okay, but the reality is that here's an example of when the wisdom of the elders should have been followed. But the truth is there's a dynamic interplay between we need many voices. The Proverbs said, uh, when the, in the many counselors are very wise. And so we see, we see this at play here. We also see, uh, we can talk about the inscrutable ways of God. We see the ways in which time and again, as Israel is being torn apart, we realize that in some mysterious, providential way, God says, this is happening because of me. And it's not just because God is mean, and it's not just because God is arbitrary or something like that. He is disciplining his people in the same way that he told them that he would. Back in Joshua, in the Law of Moses, already here in the Book of Kings, every time. He has the opportunity. He says, if you will follow me, you will continue in the land. And you will continue to be my people. But on the day that you go your own way and rebel and follow other gods and go against all of my statutes, I will ultimately kick you out of the land of Israel. Because this is not just sort of yours for the possession. This is yours in the kingdom of God. In orientation, in relationship with God himself. And so what we see is the discipline of God that works mysteriously, even in the lives of his people, and sometimes in hard ways. I mean, even words of judgment. We see this in particular in the book of Jonah, when Jonah goes to Nineveh. And he says, I think it's in 40 days God's going to destroy this city. He doesn't even tell them that if they repent, God will have mercy on them. But even the word of judgment 
includes in it the implicit offer of forgiveness. Because that's what they do. They responded to the prophetic, judgmental word of Jonah by repenting. And what follows is God has mercy on them. And Jonah said, I knew you were going to do that. Okay? And so the reality is, if God is confronting you and me, or if God is confronting his people saying, I'm going to do this, it's not simply like a for it's an invitation that we would repent because God is telling us so that we would repair our ways, so that we would turn to him again. And we see this again and again with the people of Israel. We see it with Rehoboam and Jeroboam. I mean, Jeroboam, the Lord said, if you will just follow me, and yet Jeroboam followed his own ways. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And God's word came to pass in his life. Lastly, here in the book of 1 Kings, just this final point that I want to make again later on in this series, is when the Lord is laying this out to his people and explaining these things uh, in chapter 11, primarily, what we see is, he says this, it's whenever the Lord had come to Jeroboam, and he says, I'm going to discipline the offspring of David. In verse 39, he says, I will afflict the offspring of David because of all the sin that they've done. But he says, I will not do this forever. I will not do this forever. On the one hand, the discipline of God is temporary because God has restorative ends in mind. He wants to restore his people. He wants to regather his people. He loves his people. He loves us when he disciplines us. Sometimes we don't like to think about the discipline of God. and Sometimes we see it in hindsight. Okay, sometimes we confuse other things, people's sin or whatever is discipline. I mean, you know, that, that's kind of a point of wisdom for us to sort out God's discipline in our lives. But nonetheless, when discipline comes on God's people from God, he makes this point, I think, in verse 39 that applies. It says it will not be forever. And in particular, with the line of David, what we see is it was not forever that he disciplined his people. Where the books of First and Second Kings end, I mentioned this um, two weeks ago, I believe, or maybe it was in the opening message that I did. It's that the very last scene in the book of Second Kings is the very last king or heir to the throne of David is in exile in Babylon. He's been in jail since he was a child. And the king of Babylon brings him out and has him to feast with him at his table until he died. And that's the way the book ends. That's the way First and Second Kings ends. And there's this glimmer of hope that the heirs of David are still alive. Now fast forward, if you will, to the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 1, which says this. This is the book of the genealogy of of Jesus Christ, the son of David. And here's what we find. The heirs of David have survived. The discipline of God on the line of David has been temporary. And now the promises to David are coming true in the man, Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords. And we, when we read the books of First and Second Kings, but we see clearly, when we compare the kings of Israel to the king of kings, Jesus Christ, we see that Jesus is the king of kings. And he's the king of all kings and lords, and he is the king of all the kings of Israel. Where every one of them, the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah, fall short and do not live up to what God has called them to, and they, didn't, they do not fulfill all the promises and the prophecies that God had given about this nation. Jesus is the one who came to rescue and to deliver his people. Jesus is the King of Kings. Amen.